Okay, so let's see. Any, uh, I've got a few questions um, from this from the problems I assigned. Um, any other that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, it was a K instead of I. Yeah. No, it was a to the i power. It was a power of the same constant. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me um, say so. Let me let me say a few things about number one and two. Um, and I guess uh, I should I should uh, run class. I think so because I was. Um, do you know what elementary functions are calculated? Mm, no. Okay. No. <laughs> Thanks. We'll look on the schedule in the math office. Okay. 274. Um, so, from the, the phrasing of the first problem was like, find the critical points and then try to decide the nature of it. I mean, usually, problems usually say, decide the nature, right? So. It was kind of a um, clue that it wasn't the standard way to which you should do it. I mean, normally in calculus you do, um, you find the critical points if you have a function of two or three variables, right? And then you um, use a second derivative test, well, the Hessian, to decide whether it's a, a maximum or a minimum or neither, right? Um, well, in this case, the function was, um, you know, sufficiently complicated. The determinant of Hessian is zero. You're right. So, by the the class, uh, the standard way of of uh, of studying the. Um, would have given you that that is inconclusive, right? The second derivative test. Um, so, uh, what else can you do? I mean, what what other uh, tools do you have? I mean, there is one one um, uh, statement that was, you know, it's in the chap it's in this chapter, um, and I kind of implicitly mention it. Um, well, sort of mentioned it last time, but n not very explicitly. So, um, Can I yeah. Just interrupt. You said the Hessian was not positive definite. Correct. But it was positive semi definite. Does that mean it's in? Could you say? Um, yeah. So, okay. Let me let me clarify that. So, anyway, you find critical points by setting. When you don't have any constraints, by setting this equal to zero, right? So you solve partial of f with respect to x1 equal to zero and partial of x2 with respect to. Okay, how you solve this, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can do it symbolically um, using com the computer algebra systems of your choice, or you can do it um, by hand. In this case, I think it was even easier. Um, but you end up with one critical point, right? And um, if you kind of want to try the standard one, which is, come on, um, computing the Hessian, then you get the Hessian to be, what was that? The Hessian, which is the matrix, second partial of f with respect to x1. Mix second partial of f with respect to x1, x2, you know, and the same on here. At the critical point, 1, 1, turns out to be, you know, I think 2, negative 2, negative 2, 2. Now, remember there is this. Um, if let's call this matrix A, 
if A is um, positive definite, what, is, what does it mean? Basically means that if you multiply, if you take a vector U, um, U1, U2, and you multiply by the U transpose to the left and U to the right, and you get strictly positive for, you know, U non zero. Of course, for zero, it would give you zero. Then uh, one one would be a um, well. That's a general fact. So let's not. Uh, then um, uh, what do we say? Um, then the critical point is um, local minimum. Okay. If it's negative definite, then it's a local max. Right? Now what this amounts to when you write this condition is if you're able to diagonalize the matrix, diagonalize meaning write it in a kind of change the basis so that it, it becomes diagonal. On the diagonal, you would have um, the eigenvalues, right? The eigenvalues. So, uh, an example where, where it's positive definite? Um, well, let's, let's take a function that we know has a minimum, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus 2x1, x2. Okay. 3x1, I don't know, something like that. Then uh, what will be the... Um, we know this like we did last time. We know this has a minimum at 0, right? So what's the Hessian? At, well, first of all, the critical point oh, excuse me, F not F one. Two X two plus three X one. Um, so the Hessian of the second partial, right? So it would be 2, 3, 3, 2. Let's see. This is ought to be positive definite. And I probably just And I've got one that is not positive definite. So let me change this to that just that. So it's just one. Okay. Then what's the um, what are the eigenvalues of this? Um, I'm going to use lambda, but lambda is two minus lambda. One one two minus lambda, so it's lambda minus square minus one minus four lambda plus three, right? Do I get lambda minus one, lambda minus three? So lambda one is one, lambda two is three. Okay. So the eigenvalue is positive, both are positive it means in this thing, it means you can diagonalize that. You can change the basis so that it looks like. <clears throat> uh, how do you usually call the change of basis? Q inverse 
as a matrix 1, 3. Right, everybody remembers diagonalization? Probably in linear algebra is this kind of from diagon values for some for some uh, invertible matrix Q okay so now if I if I apply this you transpose um, well even or yeah so if I apply this Q inverse I mean you you transpose a U this is going to be U transpose Q inverse this diagonal matrix, let's call this D, Q, U, right? Let's see, what I'd like to say here then is that um, if I call Q U to be a, the new vector, let's say V, I'd like to say this V transpose D V. Is that true or not? The thing is when you multiply a diagonal matrix by V, you pick that component. Like, imagine you multiply uh, D by, by a vector, then you're going to get the first component of V, and then three times the second component of V. Right? When you multiply the, co the, ro the column here, I mean the row, by this, you're going to just square that, so it, it's just going to be V1 squared plus 3 V2 squared. And you see this is positive if if v is not zero for v not zero okay the only thing that we got to justify is is this um, the transpose of v in other words the transpose of this so v is Q U, what's the transpose? It's going to be U transpose Q transpose. So is the Q inverse the same as Q transpose? When you do diagonal diagonalization, you can do it with a matrix that is I think you can pick Q to be Q inverse to be Q transpose, meaning that Q times Q transpose is the identity. That amounts to saying what? That you pick Q to have the columns to have unit length. So you can actually renormalize uh, the eigenvectors. Remember, what is the columns of Q are, are consist, consist of eigenvectors for each corresponding eigenvalue. So you can always pick those eigenvectors to have unit length. Okay? So you can you can basically get this. Um, condition to be satisfied. So this expression U transpose A U, you know, again if you, if you can uh, if your eigenvalues are positive, end up uh, end, ends up being positive, right? For all V's, for all U's uh, that are not zero. Okay? So in other words, positive definite positive definite uh, metrics that is diagonalizable if all eigenvalues are 
po strictly positive, right? If you get an eigenvalue that is negative, then what's, what does that mean? It basically means that, well, in, assuming you can still diagonalize, it means that you're going to get some negative sign here. It means that you can go in that direction, in the direction of, of an eigenvector corresponding to a negative eigenvalue, and have that expression to be negative. Okay, now why is the sign of that expression important when A is a Hessian? So the sign of U transpose AU, uh, where A is the Hessian of a function, of the objective function. F in a certain direction um, is important because because of Taylor's Taylor uh, Taylor's expansion series expansion. So let's let's remember that um, briefly. It says for a function of one variable. Let's say a function of one variable. So F of x at a critical point, so near x equals x star, which is a critical point. So this would be f of x star plus f prime of x star, x minus x star, plus f double prime of x star over 2 factorial x minus x star squared and so forth, right? That's the Taylor expansion. Now, if x star is a critical point, the derivative is 0, okay? So this guy is 0. And you can see that f the value of f at x at a nearby x is f of x is f of x star plus the second derivative that would be the, the Hessian in, in one dimensions x minus x star squared right plus higher order terms or if you don't want to talk about higher order terms, there is there is something called uh, an intermediate value that you can you can assign x x tilde between x and x star so that this is, becomes an exact equality, right? And now look at the signs. So if the second derivative is this is one dimension. If the second derivative is positive at the critical point then both of these are positive, right? So f is going to be bigger than f. The value of, of f at x is going to be bigger than the value of, f, of x star. So x star is a minimum, right? So if f double prime of x star is positive, that means x star is local minimum, right? And if x, f, f, f of x star is negative, then x star is local, local local maximum. If the second derivative is zero, then you you can't really tell from here, right? Now let's go to to several dimensions. So n greater than one. Then there is I don't know where you I don't know if you actually see this, um, but there is an, an analog Taylor expansion. So f now is a scalar function but it's a of a vector uh, variable so x is has two or, two or more components you still have the same thing here except of course you have to make sense of what this term is and what that term is so what's what would be the analog in the in the several dimensions the derivative becomes a gradient right f of x star this is scalars but now it's a gradient 
dotted with x minus x star, this would be the linear approximation or the linearization, right? <clears throat> Again, this is now a vector and this is a vector, so it's a dot product between the two, or if you like, it's a matrix multiplication. If you write the gradient as a, as a row and the, the x as a column, then it's going to be just matrix multiplication. Yeah? And if you go one step further, you, what you're going to see is the Hessian plus one half. And the Hessian is going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be two x minus x star terms. Okay? Now, if you if you stick with a matrix multi, with a matrix notation, then it's going to be exactly that: x minus x star transpose the Hessian of f at x star times x minus x star. And again, if you want to make this would be kind of a the expansion, but if you want to make it an exact Equality, you'd have to change x with some intermediate x tilde, for instance. Okay, but again, this is the Hessian. This is that matrix A, and this is this is exactly that term that I said. If it's positive, um, what do we know at a critical point? The gradient is zero, so this term doesn't appear. And again, the value of f is determined. I mean, in comparison with the value of f at the critical point, is determined by the sign of this thing. Okay, so this would be the U transpose A U. Okay? Now, what happens if no, so if this thing is positive, strictly positive for all U's that are not zero. Of course zero would correspond to x equals x star. That's um, but if if U is not zero, and this is always strictly positive in all directions, then we have a local minimum, right? But what if it's only positive in some directions? Well, the question is, if in some directions it's strictly positive, but in another direction it's strictly negative, right? So if you have a positive eigenvalue and a negative eigenvalue, then you don't, you don't, you have a saddle point, right? But I think the question was, what if in all directions it's strictly positive, but one or a few directions where it's zero? What if it's zero? So if is greater than or equal to zero for all uh, u, you know, whatever in R n, um, called semi positive definite. So if at a critical point you find out the Hessian has a zero eigenvalue, meaning the determinant is zero, that would kill the second derivative test, I mean the standard one. Um, the answer is still inconclusive. So there are saddle points, there are critical points, for which this uh, Hessian is semi-positive definite. So you cannot conclude you have a local minimum or local maximum. What turns out to be true, though, is, um, and I think we either see it today or Friday, is that if it's if this is if this condition is true, not only at a critical point, but in a neighborhood of the critical points of the critical point. So if this condition is true for say all x, not just at the critical point, then you can conclude uh, that you have a local minimum because this corresponds to what, what do we say convex function. So convex function. For a convex function, um, you only need, or is characterized by only semi-positive definite. Okay? So you could have, what's a convex function? It could, it could be like a, like a well, like a V-shaped channel. Think about that. A channel in so a function of two variables that has a graph like a V shape. Then what happens? Along one direction, it's constant. 
right? So same, same, it has the same level. So along that direction, what's going to happen? The Hessian is going to be zero. zero. I mean, the Hessian applied to this vector, to this direction, is going to be zero. Nevertheless, the function has a minimum, right? Of course, they're, they're all, all this minimum aligned, right? And of course, that's just a symbol. And of course, in other directions, this is strictly yeah, greater than the minimum. Okay. Um, so anyhow, this is what this is the situation that occurs in that particular problem. But so you cannot really say you, have, you need a different method. You need a different argument. So um, the second derivative test is inconclusive. Now again, if it happens that uh, the Hessian of f is semi-positive definite, in a whole neighborhood, neighborhood of um, of the critical point, then we conclude this is local minimum. But we need this co concept of convex function. We're going to talk about it today. Um, okay. But in absence of this, and it, sometimes it's hard to check that. This thing, this thing is. It, is sometimes I mean it's most of, even for that example it's hard. Why is it hard? Because the Hessian, unless you evaluate it at one point, in that case was one one, and you give a specific metrics that you can find the eigenvalues of. Right? How can you um, figure out the Hessian at an arbitrary point, x one, x two? Well, you can write it down, but then how you have to basically look at the eigenvalues and see if the eigenvalues stay positive in the neighborhood. So it could be a little bit tricky. Nevertheless, I think that's the case in that example. Um, I don't know if any of you had plotted that function. Did it look like it has a minimum? It does. Um, and so, what's 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 what would be sort of an argument? Um, well, the better argument is if a um, uh, continuous function um, f of x satisfies one of the following. Well, I mean, let me just first state it like this. If a continuous function satisfies that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is infinity. And what does this limit mean? This, mean, this means that in all directions, right, in multiple variables, if you have x has two or more components, you could go to infinity in many, many different ways. So at least one of the one of the um, components has to go to infinity, right? If that's if that's the case, then uh, f has a minimum value. Why is that? or achieves a minimum value at, at a point in the domain. So if the function is, is defined on the entire line, on the entire you know, plane or space or whatever, and it, is, it goes to infinity as x goes to infinity, what does it mean? It means that if you stay
pick a level set. Pick a level set for so the condition C. So why the condition C implies that um, each level set of the function, what's the level set? It's x so that f of x is less than or equal to some, some value c is bounded. Okay? So take a value, whatever value you like. Of course, it should be a value that the function takes. Otherwise, this would be an empty set. So take a value c. You know, let's just plot it in 2D. So f equals c and f less than c. Why is this thing bounded? Well, it cannot be unbounded because if it were unbounded, it means it could go to infinity and stay in the set. And then the function will go to infinity, so it would exceed this, this bound. So in this bounded set, I have a continuous function. So what do I conclude? There's both a minimum and a maximum. Now, why is the minimum value then the minimum value of the function uh, of the entire function? Well, because outside of this level set, the function is bigger than this, right? So, whatever minimum this function achieves in this set, that's the global minimum, right? So, f is continuous on this set. And this is bounded. It means that f achieves um, minimum value. Of course, it could be on the boundary or it could be inside. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is it has a it has a minimum, and that minimum is, is therefore going to be global minimum. Say, say at x star, and x star is a global minimum. So all you have to, f all you have to verify. Well, if you are if you are allowed to go in all directions, if the function is defined on the entire space, so if it's a non-constrained optimization then all you do is you verify that, that, that the function goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. How do we see that for a specific example, for this one, for instance? Unconstrained optimization. If I square this, If I, if, I, if I imagine squaring this, I'm going to have x1 squared, x2 squared, right? Of course, I'm going to have x1, x2. Uh, and here, I'm going to have x1 squared, x2 squared, x1 squared, x2 squared, right? Everything with a positive sign. So what, what does that mean? That means that if as x goes to infinity, meaning that, for instance, x1 squared plus x2 squared goes to infinity, right? Then this, this expression is x1 squared plus x2 squared make this function go to infinity. Of course, everything else is dominated by this, the, the leading order terms. So that's, for instance, one way to, um, to basically s say that. So in number one, Limit as x1, x2 go to infinity of, you know, 2 minus x1 minus x2 squared plus 1 plus x1 plus x2 minus x1, x2 squared is 
plus infinity, it means that the function f has a minimum value and achieved at a minimum point. And since we only have one critical point, 1, 1 is the only critical point. It means that 1, 1 is a minimum point, global minimum. Okay. Now, what if you have constraint optimization? So if you, have, if you try to minimize a function, but not in all directions, but only in, you know, on a subset, So for constraint optimization problems, two things can happen. I mean, let's say minimize the function f subject to some inequalities and some equality constraints. OK? So what are the two things can happen? If, well, several things can happen, but the two, the two cases when you can automatically say that, that it has a minimum, if uh, the feasible set, which is x, you know, um, satisfying both inequality and equality constraints, is bounded, then there is an optimal solution. <coughs> and again, why is that? Um, you have a continuous function, well, and I should say continuous function, f continuous. You have a continuous function, well, f, g, and h should be continuous. You have continuous uh, functions over a bounded set in Rn, then there is a minimum value, right? And the minimum value is achieved, um, you know, in the feasible, I mean, the, the solution is a feasible solution, too. Yes? Does it work uh, like the other way around, like, uh, if you like the Then you have a maximum, yeah. Okay. It's just upside down. Um, if um, if the feasible set is not bounded, so there are there are directions in which you can escape to infinity, but along along those directions or paths, the function is goes to infinity. Then there is is an optimal. Solution as well for the minimization problem. Okay, and the argument is the same. It's just you're going to take. So imagine the constraint is a line. If it's the constraint is a line, um, what are you going to do? You're going to take the level sets of this function f intersect it with that line, right? Well, whatever boundary region you have for the unconstrained optimization intersecting with a feasible region, you, you get a bounded set. In that bounded set, you have a minimum for f. That minimum is also going to be a global minimum. In other words, it's going to be a minimum for all, for all uh, feasible solutions. OK? So that this applies to, um, I think, the second problem and the third problem. So let's see. Let's, um, Let's look at this subject to the constraint that the sum of x i's is constant.
So, I mean, you can postpone the question of do I have a minimum before I even start looking for it. You can postpone this, you know, till the end. But um, it might be a good idea to ask this question um, initially because sometimes you may not have an optimal solution. Like if you try to maximize rather than minimize. If you try to maximize the subject to this constraint, what will be the answer immediately? Well, this constraint doesn't preclude you know, some x's to go to infinity, right? So it's an unbounded feasible region, feasible set. Well, what, what happens when, when some, at least one t, uh, x, at least one component of, of, of x goes to infinity? Well, you're summing positive terms and one of them would go to infinity, so the whole thing goes to infinity, so there is no maximum. Right? So the maximum is infinite, so there is no optimal solution if, you, if you're looking at the maximizing this. Right? But because, just because of that, automatically gives you what? That there is a minimum. Yeah? By the discussion above. So there is an optimal solution. So there is an optimal solution. Since the limit as x goes to infinity, subject to the constraint, you know, h, which would be just one constraint, of, you know, this, is infinite. Okay? And of course, the hope, if you get one. Uh, if you get, if, if doing Lagrange multiplier gives you only one solution, then the conclusion is that is the minimum. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Have you uh, been able to solve this for lambda? I mean for the Lagrange multiplier. would be 2ti squared xi plus lambda times 1 equals 0, right? i from 1 to n. n is the number. So I have n. And of course, the summation of xi has to be c. Minimizing sigma or sigma squared? Sigma square. I mean, call that f. That's why, you know, call this f. This is f. Okay. And what is, what is the constraint? I mean, I usually call the constraint h would be the summation of xi's minus c, right? Sigma square is just a notation. So it's exactly like example 3.7. Yeah. Three point seven. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And then you just um, solve for x's. I mean, x each x in terms of lambda. Plug it here, get lambda. Substitute back lambda and find x's. In the end, you know, plug those um, x's into the sigma squared to get the, the minimum value. Okay. Now, one point that I I want to make is. Um, if in the first problem you you could have used a computer to have 
you know, to have this solved, um, to find the critical points. Even if you had lambda, if even if you have constraint optimization, you could have used the, the computer because you had two, you know, two or three equations. Here you have n equations, right? So you're you're limited. I mean, with a computer, all you can do is say, well, let's say for n equals three, run it. N equals four, and then see a pattern, right? But unfortunately, it's um, you know. It's, you're limited because in using the, the symbolic capabilities, if you have n like arbitrary, um, n is n can be anything. Okay, so you're kind of forced to use either by hand or some. Yeah, I guess by hand is the only one to do it. Um, and let's see. Let me say about number three, which kind of, huh? So, <clears throat> in number three, there were two. Uh, one was unconstrained, one was with, with constraints. Um, the optimization problem was this. Well, it wasn't really saying, and this was k, n minus 1. It was to optimize this quantity so, um, first without constraints and then with some constraints. Okay. So again, the very first question is, um, well, okay. I think I don't think it was actually asking for minimizing or maximizing. Um, just the critical points. So for the critical points, all you have to do is find the gradient, set a gradient equal to zero, right? Now. And I kind of realized it was it's a little bit of a dis disguised problem here. Um, and I'll tell you where this comes from. But if you just kind of follow the, the, um, uh, the procedure, you would get a system, right? You would say this partially with respect to x1, which is, you know, 2x1 minus 1 minus. And there's another x1 from x2 minus x1 squared, so it's minus 2, x2 minus x1, okay? Then the second one is, I mean, there are two places where x2 shows up, so one is x2 minus x1 squared, so it's twice that, minus twice x3 minus x2. And so forth till the last one, which is 2xn minus xn minus 1. This comes from xn appearing in that expression, plus 2xn, right? Now, and you can see that using the last. Equation, I think you can find xn in terms of xn minus. So, how do you solve this in general? I mean, just just an ad hoc method would be solve for xn or solve for xn minus one in terms of xn. Then move one one uh, one step back and and go back until you get x1 in terms of xn. I think. And what you'll find in the end is the following, x1 star, x2 star, xn star is, I think it was 1 over n plus 1, 2 over n plus 1, n over n plus 1. Okay. So again, using a computer, you probably could have figured this out for a specific value of n and then draw some conclusions or figure out how you can actually solve it. Um, and this can be a bear. I mean, I, this, this can be a, um, uh, 
You know, let me give you a little bit more insight, like why, why this, I mean, why this kind of problems? Um, take a look at, at the objective there, and instead of isolating x1 and xn like that, just imagine that you do x1 minus x0 squared plus summation of x k plus 1 minus x k k equals 1 to n minus 1 plus x n plus 1 minus x n where x naught is 1 and x n plus 1 is 0 in the end that's what that's what you that's what the objective function is it's a difference is the sum of the square of the differences of consecutive uh, terms in this C, well in this components consecutive components if you kind of start with a zeroth component you add one more component one and you add a last component to be zero okay and now look at the following picture Imagine that now I divide the interval 0 to 1 into n plus 1 or n. n plus 1 subintervals. So I have x 0 is 0. No, I'm sorry, it's not x. Let's, I'm going to use t here. Let's say t 0 is 0 t1, t2, tn, and tn plus 1. Okay. And now, imagine that I, whatever x's I get, I represent them as heights, as values of x at these locations. So I would get some sort of a discretization of a, of a function. So let's say x1 is here. x2 is here, you know, maybe x3 is here, x4 is here, and so forth. xn is this, and xn plus 1 is here. Okay. Then, what's the What's the significance? What are you trying to maximize? I mean, uh, well, what are you trying to uh, optimize? The sum of the squ squares of the differences between two things, right? So, between, between two consecutive values. So, if you imagine that this comes from a function between defined on 0, 1, okay? Then, what would be the minimum that the difference, the sum of the square of the differences will be with no constraints. Well, obviously it would be if, if, the, if the things are, are equal to each other, right? You would have a minimum. You have zero, basically. But with a constraint that x1 is, is 1, x0 is 1, excuse me. So let's say that x0 is 1 here and x n plus 1 is 0. Then it would basically say, how can I go from this value through n values to 0 to minimize the sum, the square of the, the sum of the square of the differences? Okay. So, if x is a function from 0 to 1, and x i or x k equals x at the value t k, so it's a discretization of that function, right? And basically, I would have to, uh, the objective would be the summation of. Oh, I'm sorry, with x of 0 is 1 and x of 1 is 0. 
and this would be the summation of xk plus 1 minus xk squared from 0 to n, n. Okay. Well, this difference is differences of, of, two, of, 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 of the values of a function between two consecutive points resembles the derivative, right? So this would be, so minimizing p is the disc, discrete version of minimizing the following thing. Instead of a sum, you have an integral, and here you have the derivative x prime of t squared subject to x of 0 is 1 and x of 1 is 0. Okay? Right? Because imagine like you discretize this integral using those equidistant points t1 through tn. Then the derivative is, is going to be approximated by the differences, right? You fix an n, and then it's going to be approximated by the differences x k plus one minus x k squared. <clears throat> okay, this problem is actually what 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 is going to be a calculus of variation problem. Okay, and we're going to do it in, 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 in later. But the solution to this problem is very easy to compute, and it is basically. Um, So the, the optimal x, the optimal function that minimizes this, is, is going to be uh, where x double prime equals 0. So where x is a linear function. So basically the answer is, what linear function goes from 1 to 0 in that interval? And that's exactly what you get That's why this, if you plot those points, is going to be linear function, okay? From 0 to 1. I mean, that's just an analogy. It's not, it's not like, um, it's not necessarily that you can use that continuous case to kind of find the optimal for the, for this, for the discrete case. But that's, that's, um, That's an analogy, so that's something, um, in case you're wondering, you know, why, why is this expression, why, why this expression and not, you know, what's the meaning of that expression. Now, let's say um, there's one other way, so there's a brute force method, basically just crunch this, uh, find, as I said, x1 in terms of it, and so forth. But let me um, go to um, show you kind of a more efficient way um, so let me solve the gradient of p equals 0 using recursive relations so what I like to I like to start with xk minus xk xk plus 1 minus xk The, grade, the partial of p with respect to xk, right? Minus 2xk minus xk minus 1, right? With a convention that x0 is 1 and xn plus 1 is 0. Is, yeah? So basically I'm incorporating the first and the last in this. Well, if you, if you there is a 2 that comes out and there is a 2xk So there's, I'm sorry, there's an xk plus 1 minus 2xk plus xk minus 1 equals 0. With x0 is 1 and xn plus 1 is 0. Okay? 
Now this is called a recursion relation. And let's see, how many of you have actually seen this? Solving a recursion relation before? Okay, very few then. Um, how do you solve a recursion relation? Well, it's very similar to solving a linear, system, a linear differential equation. Um, so again, there is an analogy there. Um, so this is called recursion relation of order two. Order two, it means that you solve, I mean, to find the next term in the recursion, you use the previous two. Okay. Um, so what do you, how do you do it in general? There is so-called a characteristic equation, which is exactly like when you solve uh, equation, uh, constant coefficients, linear, homogeneous differential equations. You replace the derivatives, you know, with the powers of, 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 um, of say, r. You solve for r, in this case, it's just Is a double root, okay? And then using the double root, you can actually find what x x k is, and that's basically constant c one, well, r one to the power k plus c two k. Since there's is the same one as R to the power K. So in differential equations you have that you have three cases. When the when the characteristic equation has two distinct roots, when it has one double root, when it has basically two complex conjugate roots, right? The same here is if you have a double root, you you form the general solution like this. If it were two distinct roots like r minus 1, r minus 2, then it would be what? It would be a constant times r1 to the k plus another constant times r2 to the k, not k. Yeah? k times r to the k comes from the fact that you have a double root. Well, so in this case it's simply c1, 1 to the k plus c2, k, 1 to the k, so it's just c1 plus c2, k. So you can see that xk is linear in k. How do you find c1? Well, if you know, sorry, if you know the um, one, the initial point x naught, and if you know the final po the point x n plus uh, n plus one, you get that zero is x n plus one. 1 plus, um, yeah, C1 is 1 plus C2, n plus 1, so you get C2 to be minus 1 over n plus 1. So in the end is xk is 1 minus k over n plus 1. So that's, that's, a, that's a kind of elegant way to solve that system, if you can write it as a recursion, okay? The reason why I show you this is it comes in handy when you do uh, the constraint optimization. Okay, so let's do the constraint optimization. Well, and of course you you can say what the uh, well. Okay, can you say that this is a minimum or a maximum? I mean, it should be a minimum because same reason. Uh, there are squares. There are difference of squares, right? So if you expand those, there's going to be the squares x x one squared twice actually x one squared x two squared x n squared, and some linear terms. But the square the leading terms are are dominant. So you have a minimum basically, and the minimum occurs by arranging the beads if you like in a decreasing fashion from 1 to 0, okay? Um, 
So let's think about the constraint optimization. If you, if you think about this picture again, what would be the constraint optimization? It would say, minimize that expression. You know, basically the sum of the squares of, difference, of differences of consecutive components, where the first component, the, the zeroth component is 1, the n plus 1 component is 0, right? And you're trying to arrange those values in such a way, so basically, in such a way that the weighted sum, you know, with that, think about A to be 1, for, instance, for now. A is 1. So the, the constraint was the sum of A to the I So say minimize P, which is the sum of x k plus 1 minus x k from 1 to n, again, with the conventions x0 is 1, x1 is xn plus 1 is 0, subject to the sum of uh, what? A i x i is a given constant, right? I mean, this is powers of the same constant A. So, just take A to be 1. I mean, it's the same level of complexity, pretty much. So, if you imagine the sum of, of X, well, mm, maybe yes, maybe no. But just for a second, um, basically it would mean that weighting the, each height in that, in that picture by a power of A, the sum of those has to be a given constant, right? So it's clear that the unconstrained optimal value may not satisfy that, okay? In which case you have to kind of adjust that based on this. Um, and then it's again Lagrange multipliers. But this time, there's an extra term, right? So it's going to be twice xk plus 1 minus 2xk plus xk minus 1 plus lambda a to the i equals 0. k from 1 to n. And again, with the same conventions, right? And x0 is, zero is 1 and xn plus 1 is 0. Uh, X, I'm sorry, A to the K. Okay. So the only thing is, how can you write this as a recursion relation so that it's, you can solve it? And here's uh, sort of the, the trick. Well, the 2, forget the 2. The 2 is, is kind of irrelevant. It can be moved uh, lambda over 2. Um, but so basically what you have is xk plus 1 minus 2xk plus lambda k minus 1 plus, let's say, lambda over 2a to the k. And let's do the, the previous one, xk minus 2xk minus 1 plus xk minus 2 plus lambda over 2a um, to the k minus 1. So I'm just writing two consecutive... Um, representation of that recursion relation. Now what do, you, what do you notice here? If you multiply by a lamb, by an A, this is going to be the same as this one. So you can subtract the 2 once you multiply by A, and it's going to look like, like this, xk plus 1 minus 2 plus A xk plus 2a plus 1 xk minus 1 minus a xk minus 2 equals 0. That's a third order recursion. 
relation. And the same way as we did before is you can write basically what the solution is. If you write, if you can now consider the characteristic equation, R cubed, it's a third order, right? Now you may say this is hopeless, oops, minus A. But it's kind of funny that this thing is basically factors very nicely. There's R minus 1 squared and R minus A. I mean, how do you figure this out? I think first you check that 1 is a solution. You plug in r equals 1, and you get 0. So r minus 1 is a factor, and then you get another r minus 1 factor, and then what's left is r minus a. Okay, so, I mean, this can be kind of verified. So what's the solution? x, k. c1 plus c2, k right? Plus C3 A to the K. Because okay? I have two, a one double root and I have A equals is a, is a single root. Of course this is true if A is not one and if A is one you'd be plus C2K plus C3K squared, right? Just like in the differential equation uh, case. <clears throat> so setting A equals 1 was not, it's not as a special case, sort of. Okay? Now, what's the next, what is it, what's the next thing? Once you have this, I have three unknown, three constants that I have to find. Well, I only have X naught that I know, and I know the Xn plus 1, right? So I'm going to be left with one constant that's undetermined. Well, that constant is going to be basically in terms of lambda. Okay, those be, there will be the lambda. I mean, there's going to be a lambda. Um, entering that picture, uh, how do you find lambda? Using the constraint. Right? Now, granted, I haven't really kind of computed that myself. That, that is, and I think you sh um, Young Lee showed me that it's, it's really messy. So it's, it's, it, it, it's not that I, I really wanted the final form, but. Um, what I'm, what I was looking at is, is I was looking for is, is sort of setting up the Lagrange multiplier method correctly, um, and anything else is sort of, um, I mean, brute force, you know, is is, is a way to do it. Um, I, I don't expect anybody to kind of use this kind of fancier um, recursion relation. So. So don't, you know, the fact that I showed you this doesn't mean that I, you know, I kind of expect you to know it. Um, the more important thing is, though, this interpretation that I gave you, which hopefully is going to help you when we get to variational problems. Um, many, oftentimes, will have not just n variables that we want to optimize. We're going to want to optimize whole functions. So like a function that is has a fixed value at the two endpoints of an interval, and you're trying to optimize either a gradient, like a derivative, the square of the gradient, or sometimes other uh, constraints or penalties. And, and, and then the idea is that you use the equivalent of what Lagrange multiplier method would be. Uh, which is called Euler Lagrange equations, and I don't think there is a. I mean, it's the same Lagrange, but it's not. Uh, there's no connection between, between the two methods. Well, not direct connections. Um, to kind of solve that that continuous optimization problem. 
Okay. And the discrete optimization problems are, are uh, many times, you know, messy, difficult. You don't have, you know, computers. I mean, you can use computers if you have a fixed given number of, of variables, right? But to get a pattern like this, uh, it's um, computers are still useless unless unless you do it, you know, repeatedly until you get um, a pattern. Um, let's see. After the break, I, I want to talk about this um, um, nonlinear non nonlinear optimization problems with inequality constraints, and hopefully we'll get to convex functions because. Um, as you can imagine, convex, I mean, convex functions are just functions that, you know, in 1D will look like um, holding water, right? So it's like um, concave up, you call it. And you can already see where, you know, why they're useful when you minimize. You know, you just know there is a minimum, and there's only one minimum, or maybe a, a segment of, of minimum. Um, and Anyway, so we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about convexity. If if we're not finished today, we'll do it on Friday. And should I leave the homework for for um, Monday? Yeah, to assign. No, not to assign to to do. Yeah, due date Monday or or. Hmm? This one? Not this one. The next one. Anyway, think about it and let me know by the end of the class. Um, <laughs>